Hi folks, it's good to be with you. Love to everybody out there. You can get me on my website, jasonbirdpreacher.com and you can get me on Facebook and Twitter. And we're looking today at violence in the Old Testament. And I'd like us to look at Numbers 21, verse 2 and 3. Numbers 21, verse 2 and 3. So we're going to look at violence in the Old Testament, but before we do, let's look at Numbers uh, 21, verse 2 and 3. Numbers 21, verse 2 and 3. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou wilt indeed... Deliver this people unto my, thy, my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel, and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them, their cities. And he called the name of the place Homa. And then, if we look at Deuteronomy 20.17, Deuteronomy 20.17 Deuteronomy 20.17 uh, It says But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Parasites Hivites and Jebusites, the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. And then, if you turn to Joshua chapter 6, verse 17. Joshua chapter 6, verse 17. The city shall be accursed even, and it, and all that are in it to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messenger that went, that was sent. So, we're looking at violence in the Old Testament and that's just a few verses there are other verses that say slaughter everybody man woman and child so how do we deal with these passages how we, do we deal with this kind of apparent genocide uh, in the Old Testament Richard Dawkins uh, is reputed to not want to debate uh, William Lane Craig because he accused William Lane Craig of being an apologist for genocide so how do we deal with that? So I want to uh, consider some responses. Now there are people, there are theologians that have tried to answer these questions and the way they've answered it is said, well, it was a literal kill the people but God was wrong in saying it. So you have in the early church, you had Marcion who said the Old Testament God is not the New Testament God and he was a heretic. So that was one way of trying to deal with it but that caused a division between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, you had some that believe um, it was a literal command but wrong and, mis and Israel misunderstood the command. So wasn't really a proper command and it was misunderstood by Israel anyway. Some say that the language is hyperbolic, that it's not really telling you to go and kill people. Uh, some say it's a metaphorical intent, some say it's allegorical. All these views see that the historical go of the historical Israel going into the promised land and slaughtering people 
that's not actually really happening. It's all metaphorical stuff. It's all allegory. It's all symbolic. You know. So the allegory, if there are fightings or whatever, it's allegorical teaching about the Christian faith. Origin took that view. It's metaphorical. Many scholars today say that it's all metaphorical. It didn't really happen. It's hyperbolic. It, they, it, they didn't really mean to say, to, to God didn't really mean to say go and kill. For example, there's a passage in, in uh concerning Joshua that he's to take the, all the land and he didn't take all the land yet it says he took all the land but he, he didn't take all the land so it's kind of hyperbolic it, it wasn't literal all these views undermine the historical unity of the Old and New Testament and the historical veracity the truthfulness of the Old Testament so we take, a, we're defending here a literal view that there was literally people going into the promised land and everybody gets slaughtered, okay? So I'm defending that position. How can that position be defended? The first thing to point out is that there is no simple answer. Anybody who wants a simple answer um, it's just not being realistic. This is a complex, life is complex, and this is, requires a complex answer. Unless you're willing to think it through and study, you're not really going to come to a fair understanding. So the complexity is, for example, if Richard Dawkins says it's a genocide, okay, so that's the claim that the people of the Old Testament uh, of, of Moses' time, go into the Promised Land and commit genocide. The word genocide, when we start to look and analyse the text, breaks down un under the complexity. For example, we read that Rahab was set free. So we see here that the killing of people was not based on race. Because Rahab was part of the Canaanite people, but she was set free. And some of her family was set free. So it's rather more nuanced than just saying it's genocide. First of all, the Bible teaches that God is unable to command evil. When God talks about the Canaanites and the Hittites, he talks about them in the basis that they've committed evil. And so God is not, cannot do evil. So if that is the case, if that is the default position, it means that our understanding, our moral compass has to be challenged. And, th and we have to think about this in a much more deeper way. So we've looked at this claim that it's genocide, it's much more complex. Rahab was set free, so it's not based on race. It's much more complex because it, the Bible says that God is good and, and can do no evil. And when the Bible talks about the killing of the Canaanites it's based and the Hittites, it's based on the fact that they have committed evil. Now, you might say, well, there are innocent children being killed. What's that all about? We can get to that in a minute. But it's much more complex. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 and 8. As we read that. Deuteronomy 4, 6 and 8. So we're beginning to unfold something here much, much more deeper. Deuteronomy Four, six to eight. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Who shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding people, 
For what nation is there so great who hath God as near unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call them call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and ordinances as righteous as all this law which I set before all this day? So here it's about God being a righteous and just God and all the nations looking upon the nation of Israel and being jealous of the God of Israel and the nation of Israel because they are submitted to a good, wise God. So, God is good. He can do no evil. So, to say that he's committing genocide is a contradiction. Next, there is the nuanced portrait of the Canaanites. Like I said, they were committing evil. They had been killing children. They had been slaughtering uh, children. They had been worshipping idols for centuries. And God had given them 400 years to repent. He told Abraham, I'm giving them 450 years to repent. So it's more nuanced than just saying God sends his people in to kill these innocent people. No, the Canaanites were quite, quite a very, very, very bad people. A wicked people. And then we're going to look at the wider biblical picture. Here's a question. Is it, all, is it always wrong to fly a plane into another plane? that will kill hundreds of people? Is it always wrong to fly a plane into another plane where in that plane there are hundreds of people to kill all those people? Is it always wrong to do that? Children, mothers, fathers, etc. Is it always wrong? Think about it. In September 11, when the two towers came down, there was a plane on its way to crash into, I think it was the Pentagon or some government building. And there were two Air Force pilots that were scrambled. And they had no weapons left or they, they didn't have any weapons for whatever reason. And they had to make a choice. Do we crash into the plane and bring down the plane before it hits a government building and kills five times more people than would actually die on the plane? Or do we just let the plane go and crash in? And not only the people on the plane die, but also hundreds and hundreds, 500, maybe more people die in the process where it crashes into a government building. And these two pilots decided that they would hit the plane, one on the nose, one on the back. And as they made that decision, just as they made that decision, people on the plane grabbed the terrorist and grappled with the terrorist and there was a fight and the plane crashed so the two air force pilots didn't have to go through bringing that plane down but were they right to make that decision in the first place i'm sure now that you look at that situation in that context it shows you that it's actually more complex and actually that that would have been the best decision to make it would have killed all those people on the plane, children, mothers, whatever, but it would have saved 500 more. You see? The bigger picture is, is it always wrong to take innocent life? It's not wrong to take innocent life in that context because it was saving more lives. And God 
knows the future and he knows that if the Canaanites are not annihilated he knows that far more people are going to be killed i.e. go to hell he knows that far more people are going to be destroyed so in order to save the future of humanity he has to destroy the Canaanites because if he doesn't destroy the Canaanites they will in fact infect the messianic line there is a bigger wider picture here the next thing is the moral value of actions depends on motivation and authorization God is the giver of life now if I take a baby right there's a little baby and it's my baby I, I take my little son, say I've got a son, five year old, five year old. I take my son to school. I have authorization to do that. But it's different if I just go to a school and take a five year old child home. So sorry, I take my five year old child, he's mine, he's my child, my son, and I take that child home. I have a right to. I, I'm the authorizer. I have the authorization to do that. But if <coughs> if there is a child there that's nothing to do with me, and I go to school and take it on, I'll be up for kidnap. Serious stuff. You see, authorization gives a different perspective on the moral situation. So I don't have the authorization to go around killing people. But God has the right, the authorization to say what should be done. And he has the right, the author of life, to take life if he wants to. He has the right to judge a nation if he wants to. <coughs> Ezekiel 18.23, it's in the context <coughs> of the nature of God. God, it says... In Ezekiel 18.23, forgive my phone, but in Ezekiel 18.23, God does not desire the death of the wicked. He doesn't desire the death of these people. He doesn't desire the death of these nations. He has given these nations time. He has desired that these nations repent. <coughs> they saw Israel come out of Egypt. They saw the miracles that God did to Egypt. So God was hoping that they would repent, but they didn't repent. So it says there, Ezekiel 18, 23, God does not desire the death of the wicked. And God has full future knowledge. He knows also what will happen in the future. And he knows that if these people are not wiped out, it will affect the messianic line. And then God's action in the demolition of the Canaanites is for the good of of creation and the nations within it so God wants to bless the whole of creation and the nations within it and he gave the inhabitants a chance to respond again Deuteronomy 9 4 and 4 to 5 the Canaanites were wicked next Israel was God's judicial response God's sword God used the, Jew, the, the Israelite nation to judge other nations. He has a right to do that. Now, next is that the killing of the Canaanites was part of the continuity of the divine plan. God had the divine plan for the history of the world. And so who's to say that God <coughs> does not have the right <coughs> to wipe out a nation to fulfill his divine plan which is a good plan and next thing is that Israel faced the same judgment as the Canaanites it was not <coughs> it was not arbitrary God also judged the Israelites the same way they got slaughtered and they got killed man woman and child if they disobeyed God so it was not just on the Canaanites God could be fierce in his judgment upon his own people so it was not 
God just picking on one nation, but God uh, even judged his own nation if they were disobedient. <coughs> Next, it was only for a particular time. It was only for that period of time in order to fulfill a particular purpose that God's people would take the promised land. <coughs> it, was <coughs> it was not for all time to go around slaughtering nations. The killing of the Canaanites was also the anticipation of the future. It points to that on the last day there will be severe judgment. So we have to learn from this slaughter that the judgment of God and his wrath is fierce. And we're to fear that judgment. <coughs> and, this <coughs> Excuse me. and this action is to be seen in the light of the cross. <coughs> there God came down and died for us and gave his life for us on that cross. Showing you that God took the punishment for the world. And showing you that God loves people the world and also showing that that God is not a vindictive just judgmental God that God is a redeeming God and that all the time God is working the purpose of history out for redemption and all this was not the ideal this mess that the human race had got in was not the ideal but God has worked it out for good, for his glory, and for the blessing of humanity. So, if you take these, the literal view, uh, the view that God got it wrong about the slaughter in the Old Testament, you, you, broke a, you bring a wedge between the Old Testament and New Testament. Marcion split the gospel, the Old Testament, New Testament, the Old Testament is a horrible God, the New Testament is a loving God. If you go that route, you say the Old Testament is not of God, you split the Old <coughs> New Testament. If you take the symbolic view, you or hyperbolic or metaphorical or allegorical, you undermine the historical unity of the Old Testament and New Testament. But if you take the literal view, you have the continuity. You, the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New and there is one thread, the covenant of God, right through the Old and New Testament. So I hope these parameters will show you that it's much more complex than uh, Richard Dawkins and others would say. And unless you're willing to consider exegetically the many texts, uh, which we've only looked at one or two unless you're willing to engage with Christian theology and Christian text in a fair way you'll not have a fair answer so there we are so I hope that's been a help to you I hope that's been a blessing to you violence in the Old Testament uh, I hope that's given you some ways now to see that the horrendous killings in the Old Testament, that there are, there are parameters that as we build these building blocks, that we can see the divine purpose behind it. That it's more complex and nuanced than just saying, oh, it's genocide, I don't believe it, don't agree with it. Much more grander picture, much more different shades to the situation. And unless you're intellectually honest and spiritually desiring to find God, you're not going to accept that answer. You're going to dismiss it out of hand and say, no, 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 it's all about genocide. But if you're open and honest and listen to what I've just said, then it will give you some understanding of those texts. And also, uh, for those who are Christians, uh, I hope what I've shared with you will, will strengthen your faith uh, and will help you to realize that you don't have to feel intimidated when people say, the Old Testament is violent. I don't agree with it. Go over this video a few times. Grasp the arguments that I've given you. And they'll be a help to you. God bless you. Hope that's been a blessing. God bless.